know, the difference between um, Western schools, I may just mention in the last um, video, but I don't think I completed my thought with it. And even if I did, I didn't thoroughly expound on everything I thought about. So I want to show y'all how in Hindu astrology, they take the movement of the moon and allow its place to determine where they should start your count. And so that your time of birth is very crucial in that system because the exact place of the moon is what we use. But in modern Western schools, we use the natural motion of the sky. Unlike the classical system that use time periods that are already set in order, Chaldean order or or the order of the nakshatras, you know, the nine lords, then we are using pure apparent motion, or I use a pure, pure, purely apparent motion. I mean, every now and then I've dabbled in the uh, time periods, the time of the very relevant. I don't want to, you know, downplay that or discourage anyone from digging deep into that because I still use, I use perfections, I use um, vimsatari. Right? But when you're doing modern Western astrology, right, we, we, everything is based on the apparent motion of what? The apparent motion of all celestial bodies, calculative points in the entire sky for that matter. Right? Now, the reason why I bring that up is because in ancient Egypt, when they used the stars for divine purposes or mundane purposes, they talked about the rising, the culmination, and the setting. And then they were doing astrology, right, with these stars. They weren't just using it to, to measure the length of every day or the speed of, or, 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 or the rate of the earth's turning, right? They gave significance to risings, to culminations, and to settings, and to when it reached the nadir of the bottom of the chart, right? Which is the IC and it's Latin, right? This is the mid C, pardon me, the mid heavy, right? This is the D ascending, and this is the A ascending. And the reason why these four groupings were very important because they represented different seasons. Seasons, you see? Because the temperature of the earth changes through the seasons, right? The temperature of the day changes through this cycle. And they were all into cycles and the science of resurrection. So the recurring pattern of everything in creation, in, in, in reality, on this earth, in the worldly life, is a natural phenomenon under which we live. So the fact that, I don't need to advocate all that, right? but the, the, the fact that they were using apparent motion is what I'm stressing here, right? So, these four points on the chart are called the angle, right? The cardinal points, right? They deal with the directions, north, east, south, and west. But then again, this is east. This is uh, south. If you're north of the equator, it'll be the opposite. The entire arrangement will be opposite if you're south of the equator, like in Australia, Brazil, South America. You know, places like that, right? This is, for all intents and purposes, west. I'm dealing with the north because most charts, most people, northern hemisphere is more populated. I mean, I can think of a million reasons, but this is what I'm accustomed to, right? And really, this is not north. It's the most northern part of the consideration, of the measure. But this is really opposite side of the planet, you know? where the earth turns away from, all of this turns with it in appearance. Right. So now, 
One example, can everybody get this? I hope y'all got this. Because this mental note, you use it throughout the entire your entire career. <laughs> I don't ever consider when somebody tells me what time of day they were born, this right here is the first thing that comes to mind. And are they born in this sector, this sector, this sector, that sector? That's the first thing that comes to mind. So you know, my wife told me that she told a friend of hers that I do charts in my head and that person was amazed. And this person is an astrology enthusiast too, right? I don't understand how you cannot understand how to do some of this stuff in your head if you're doing it every day, if you, if you make a living at this shit. I do it in my dreams too. Apparent motion. One example of apparent motion is the retrograde. You see? And for so that people will understand how it is apparent that it is not really moving backward. And it only matters because as it appears, so so is the what it gives indication to. Right? But a retrograde is like you traveling around a bend. Okay? You got this car on the outside, moving at 60 miles per hour, right? And you start with this car, right? And you, you may, you may, you start behind him, okay? Let's say you're going faster because you're on the inside of any track. This is why you see tracks in the college, they, they, the, the start line aren't, the start lines aren't even because they're taking into consideration that curve, right? So, this car is coming around the bend. You come from behind the car and pass it, right? This car never stops moving forward at 60 miles per hour, right? But, and neither do you stop moving forward at the rate that you're going that allows you to pass by them. But at, let's say we were filming them from our car. We would see them in front of us and as we passed them, they would go behind us. They would never stop moving forward, but they would appear to move backwards. There goes your retrograde motion. And there is not a school of astrology on the planet Earth that I know of that doesn't take retrograde motion into account in terms of its measure, its duration, and its delineation. Right? And what it means, its translation. Right? So now if you say you was going all the way back around this chart, I mean around this bend, Say it was a circle. As you went back around this way, at some point, this car would stop moving backwards. You would see that it is moving forwards again. Unless you got to the other side of the track. Then when you caught up to it again, it would repeat itself. This happens with Mercury three times a year, right? All of the planets except the Earth go retrograde, right? Planets, I'm not talking about the sun and the moon and the lights. The sun does go retrograde. Right? If you want to say it doesn't go retrograde. Every 179 to 180 years, it goes retrograde for about 30 minutes of arc, almost 30 minutes of arc. So you can do your research on that because of the battery point. Right? But I'm not here talking about that. I, I want to talk about this apparent motion. That was one justification, one easy um, example of how apparent motion, but that's not the only one we use, all right? The way they rise, culminate, and set is important because, you know, I got so many astrologers saying that they do, they come to me and they want to build, all right? And I would love to build too. I would love to find somebody who I can build with, right? So I understand when they come to me and they want to build. And some of them are in complete doubt or skeptical that any event astrologically can be predicted to the day. The same people that have this doubt, coinky dinky or concurrently to be more accurate, right? They don't predict, they can't, they don't know how. So they're all based on apparent motion. How the sky rises in the east and sets in the west in its appearance. Now, what you have to understand is that the rate of the sky is not always the same. Certain signs rise faster than other signs. 
And these are called the sides of long or slow and short or fast ascent. Okay? My entire predictive method entirely relies on the speed of the sky at any given point in the day here where I am in Georgia and um, all over the, every place I've ever been in the United States Pisces is the fastest sign of the zodiac there's even a symbolic reference to it in the Quran where the Surah Tokath, the 18th chapter, or the 18th Surah. When they talk about this sign, they're going to meet this man. Or Moses and the attendant is going to meet this man. And the sign that they were looking for was the fish taking off in a marvelous way. Right? Well, in a fantastic way, in a marvelous way, in an unusual way, whatever that Arabic word should really be translated to, it points to the sign of the fish. So, when Pisces is rising, the 30 degrees that we're calling Pisces, that I'm referencing as Pisces, can rise anywhere from an hour and 12 minutes to an hour and a half in the Northern Hemisphere, in the United States. That means uh, everything on the same latitudes, all right, which is like Miami's 25 degrees north and um, New York City is 40, all right? Maine is like 41, 42, no, even, even higher than that, right? 44, maybe 45, right? So, between those latitudes, Pisces rising higher all the way around the globe, all right? So, it's not just the United States. You got Europe, you got the Middle East, parts of the Middle East, all of them are on parallel. With the with the with the land mass and the territory we reference as the United States. So understand the 30 uh, degrees that it, it takes Pisces to rise. It may rise for 72 minutes, for example. Okay. And then the signs of Aries may match or exceed that of Pisces. The signs of Taurus takes a little bit longer, okay? And through the course of the year, these signs rise shorter. In other words, go out there and measure when the sun is at zero degrees Pisces and then advance your chart every 24 hours, you know? In the United States, it could be anywhere from 22 to 18 days. Conversely, the longest sign in the Northern Hemisphere is the sign of Leo. It's 30 degrees. Um, it comes straight to my mind. I spent most of my life in DC, right? And at the 38th parallel, it takes 151 minutes of time. Compared to Pisces, 30 degrees and 72 minutes, right? This is an hour and 12 minutes. If you divide that by 30, you get the rate of Pisces rising in your locale. It's not always going to be 72 minutes. 72 minutes operates at the 38th parallel. It's different when you go north and south of the equator. All right? So, but for this example, for this location, the location I'm using is Washington, D.C. Right? Which is about 38 degrees north. All right? In some minutes. Okay, but the 151 is two and a half hours and one minute. So that's uh, two hours and 31 minutes. You see? Now, predictive manner, 
You can't really say, oh, because Mars is five degrees from the ascendant, before it hits the ascendant, then it's gonna equal five days. You can't say that. You can't say here that because Mars, all right, or any planet, let's just say the moon, is five degrees from the ascendant, then it's gonna take five days. Where they say that one degree equals one day. It's not true. <laughs> All right? Because this five degrees takes about, on average, almost five minutes per degree. And this one is almost three minutes per degree. Okay? So, when you take it into account, you know, I'm, 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 I'm six and a half, you're looking at the, the, the chart of a six and a half year old, right? It's six and a half years old. That's six and a half days. But the sign rising or setting would determine the predictability, the ability to bring it, to, to, to take that apparent motion and turn it into lifetime. What I'm stressing here is that these basics, these are basics here. This is not advanced astrology. I mean, it's advanced in terms that you're doing predictive, but it is very basic. Every chart, whether it's predictive astrology or not, is based on these principles here, okay? So when somebody calls me for a sample, a five minute sample, do you, I don't have time to pull up their birth chart and give you five quality minutes of time. So I had to learn this, right? When somebody wants a prediction, I can't afford to be six days off, four days off. Neither can you if you want to be a real astrologer, right? You want to tell people the truth of their life based on this symbolic speech, and which is the planetary symbols, you see, and their emotions. This is how heaven talks to you, right? Now, you, it's the lack of understanding of this motion is the reason why people can't seem to apply the mathematics to it, you see? I want to show another way that Western astrology is based purely on apparent motion, all right? Um, the planets, okay? We use the signs, we use the cardinal points, the horizon and setting, you know, because at one time, I only predicted planets moving across those four points because really um, those are the most apparent you know a lot of the things planetary motions only pertain to subjective matters what a person thinks what kind of emotions they're going through you know and it's subjective to that extent and those astrologers that haven't really measured this believe it can be done you got these skeptics like Neil deGrasse and all these other people that say, I have tested astrology. No, you haven't. You haven't tested the measure according to the apparent motion. You haven't had no idea what apparent motion is. So, and that is what legitimizes Western and modern astrology. The fact that the rate of these planets, so it's not just the rate of the signs. It is the rate of the planets, the length of the, the retrogrades, and the, uh, the aspects, you see that this is what is being used. Let me show you how apparent astrology, I mean how apparent motion is used in astrology again. If we use a solar centric system, right? All right. Earth's path. Right? And the moon, right? goes around the sun. I am not going to sit here and debunk and on uh, um, flat earth. I don't, I'm not even going to get into that. I'm not going to entertain that. Okay? Um, Mercury takes 88 days solar centrically. 88 to 89 days to go around the sun. The earth 
365 point, approximately to five decks. Okay? So we see Mercury go around four times. In actuality, when the Earth goes around once. That mathematical constant is reflected in our breath and our, our life force, our heartbeat, all right? So the heart is the sun in astrology. Bad aspects to the, to the sun also give indication of uh, attack or fault, faulty health with regards to the heart, all right, the, and, and the system that the heart is the central cardiovascular system, okay? So, and Mercury, I'm going to use the symbols, all right? And Mercury is the lungs, and therefore breathing, right? Respiratory. Right? Or respiratory system, right? Well, our heart rate and our breath rate have the same ratio. I learned this from Raleigh Nate for Amen. One to four ratio. Okay? This is another reason why I don't believe in aliens. <laughs> you know? Do they breathe at a one to four rate? And does Mercury concur? Does the does the cycle of Mercury concur with their life systems that allow them to breathe. In their solar system, if it's a one to four, is their year the same as ours? Because all of that, you are our, you are the solar system is more accurate than you are the universe. Remember that. All right, but at any rate, um, so this four time, but because the earth is moving, right? And we're moving around, we move around the sun while Mars is moving around. One of those four times is lost in, in Earth's advancement. See, so we really see the Mercury retrograde three times a year. And when we see it four times a year, is that the, we, let's say this is four years, right? We see it at the beginning, we see it in this year, we see it in this year, and when we see it four times, it's at the very end of the year. But generally, it's three times a year that we see a Mercury retrograde, okay? Now, that's just one way that the apparent motion of our solar system reflects a cycle in our own physique, okay? We're going to talk about declinations. Because it is often ignored in modern astrology and other astrological schools in the, in the East, they don't talk about declinations. And declinations, let's say this is the horizon. This is East and this is West, right? In the wintertime, Right, let's say this platform is a, is a circle, but I'm going to do it oval, right? Okay. We're standing on a platform. Let's just sit at, right? And we're going to use this platform to measure where the sun rises and sets. All right? In the northern hemisphere, on spring day, it rises due east and sets due west. And now, uh, all right? And it does this in the autumn. So we get 12 hours here, and 12 hours is under the earth, right? So it will rise here. We'll put a, a stripe, we'll paint a stripe right here in due east and due west. And on March 21st, standing on this platform, we will see the sunrise in line with this stripe if you're standing right here at the center, right? Now this is only on the first day of spring, the first day of autumn. This is why they call it the equinox. 
because the sun rises and sets in in half of a day, in half of the time it takes a complete day to, to occur. So both the day and the night are of equal light. Nox means light and equi means equal. Right? So the, the the night is 12 hours and the day is 12 hours. Okay? It really varies by a few seconds because it's constantly turning things. Right? After the first day of spring, the sun starts to rise more and more north, about a degree, you dig? Almost a degree. So that when you're standing here, looking due east, that is off to the left a little, that the sun rises. And then it sets a little. Each day it moves towards this way. Until the solstice. Where the, where the day can be 14 hours long and the night can be 10 hours long, right? Actually, I think it's uh, 17 hours. Close to 17 hours, right? A little bit more. And for, for seven hours is, is night. Dark and light, right? All right. But then from... From spring to summer, it moves a little bit northerly from our position on this platform. Right? Well, it goes back to autumn, where it's a 12 hour day, 12 hour left of nighttime. But then, as it goes towards the winter, the sun starts rising here, right? And the daylight hours get shorter until the winter solstice. I didn't write summer over here. Right? Until the winter solstice, this would be the summer solstice, right? That I spoke about. All right. So in the winter solstice, it, once it reaches like December 21st, we have the least amount of daylight hours and the greatest amount of uh, night light, night hours, right? So it's the same thing. 17 hours of night or dark and 7 hours of day or light, okay? Now because of this cycle, you notice how things fluctuate in your own life. It is according to this cycle that the seasons are accurately measured and that the astrologers use declinations. Right? I'm not done. What I want to demonstrate it is, if you if we use one day equals one year, system of prediction, it's basic, it's in every basic astrology book, they tell you one day equals one year, and we look at the life of Malcolm X, okay, I use this chart a lot because he's a public figure, all right? And I study this chart a lot, so to understand his life and understand how to use the science, right? Um, in the declination, this oh, his father died when he was nine years old. Okay, so when we look at the ninth day of life after he was born in the longitudinal chart, we don't see we don't see any apparent motion in that chart. That shows the death of a father. That gives definite indication of the death of a father. But he was born with Mars and uh, Pluto in the eighth sign of his natality, of his birth chart. All right. And when we when we put the secondary progression. Which is one day equals one year. We do not see any action from these on any point in the chart that gives indication to the mother or the father or to a household member for that matter. Right? So we look at the sixth day after his birth and we don't see that. But if we look into the declination, we will see that the planet Mars 
has shifted to the de to the natal declination, and it is in perfect conjunction on the sixth day of his life. This Mars and Pluto in the eighth sign describes his, uh, his experience with death, and Cancer is the sign that it was in when he was born. Though in longitude, they do not connect in the declinations. Mathematically, they do. And let me explain declinations. They not only are the reason why the daylight hours are longer and shorter, you notice that the sun is higher in the sky in the summer, and it is lower in the sky in the wintertime. It is closer to the horizon, right? And, and, and it rises behind you if you're looking due south. And in the wintertime, it rises in front of you. Off to your left or right rises and sets, but it's still in front of you. It, it, the, the, the angle, the, the arc is less in the winter than it is in the summer. It is more, you see? The arc, the angle, where the sun rises and sets on the horizon. And that arc right there, right, is responsible I mean, it's because of the declination of the earth. It leans 23.46 degrees, right? You have to go look and see. I can't pour it all into one video. And I, I really would like for y'all to join my school because we get into it step by step, component per component in, in class as opposed to the video. But at any rate, the end of declinations, Mars conjuncted the natal, the natal station of Pluto. You see? So apparently, declination is when you have what we call the um, the celestial equator. So you have to go study a little bit of astronomy. <laughs> All right? So you can know what these things are. This is why, in the beginning, I said, you know, astrologers come to me, I wish I could build with them. When I get talk, talking about the celestial equator, and the signs of long and short ascent, there's only a few of them that have the slightest clue what I'm referencing. And then people come to me and they're like, I want you to teach me the formula. I give you the formula. If you don't understand this, how are you going to understand how to implement that math and how to apply that math to this motion? That's the catch. So that's the reason why I'm doing the video, right? So you have the celestial equator. Right, which is zero degrees. It's like the equator of the Earth projected on a flat plane out into space in every direction. Okay? And then you have the ecliptic. So on, on the first day of spring and the first day of autumn, the sun is on the celestial equator. But as the year goes on, it moves north. And by... June 21st, it's 23 degrees from the celestial equator, from where the ecliptic would be on the first day of spring and on the first day of fall, right? And it is below the celestial equator in the wintertime, right? And it moves in a path like this, you know? This is called the analemma. But I'm dealing with the declination. The fact that it moves north of the celestial equator, south of the celestial equator, by degree, it moves north, all the way up to 23 degrees. And then it comes back at the spring, I mean at the fall, and it moves down, right? Degree by degree, till it gets to 23 degrees, right? That declination is a measurable, eyewitnessable phenomenon, an apparent motion. The vertical motion of the sun, okay, as opposed to the longitudinal east-westerly motion of the sun, you also have a north-south motion. And when Malcolm X's father died, he was 66 years old. So if we're using one day equals one year, we look at the sixth day of his life. And on the sixth day of his life, Pluto was at 21, right, I believe. Yeah, Pluto is like up here at 21, all right? 21 or 22. And Mars was closer to 20. But in the six days, first six days of his life, 
which is indicative of the first six years of his life, by apparent motion, Mars in his course came to the place where Nate, where Nato Pluto stood. That is another example of how apparent motion of the planets is applied in astrological technique for prediction, right? That's basically what I wanted to get across. Because a lot of people say, well, what is the difference between Vedic astrology and Western astrology? And people believe that Vedic astrology is more accurate because they don't study the astronomy of apparent motion and apply that mathematically to the events proportionately one day per year. You can call me anytime between 1 and 7 p.m. Eastern for a sample reading. Okay. My phone number is 516-881-6992. Press the subscribe button. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. It was a dissertation on how apparent motion is used in Western astrology as opposed to the time periods used in Hellenistic classical astrology and Vedic astrology.